brief. Here we go. Welcome to lecture six, which is actually in week. Welcome to lecture six, which is actually week eight ish. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to start diving into the select statement. Last week I covered the basic DML, the first DML commands, which is the insert, update, and delete, and the very most basic select statement. Um, I also covered alter and create table. Uh, the select statement is where the bulk of the SQL language resides. There is a lot you can do in it, and it's actually going to take the next couple of weeks to cover the basics. I'm not talking in depth here, we're talking basics. Uh, when I went to school, my SQL course, literally SQL, was an entire term. So I'm going to cover as much of that as I can in, you know, three to four weeks. In other words, you're getting the, the abridged version. All right. So what am I covering this week is the basic select statement. I covered that at the end of last class, but I'll do it again this class real quick. I'm going to talk about, and I have a typo, distinct records. I know I said that last term too when I looked at the slide. I said I have a typo. Again, I said it again, and I'll probably forget to fix it again. Uh, talk about how to order your record, and then uh, if all goes well, we'll talk about aggregate functions, grouping, aliases, and miscellaneous other useful functions. And then when I'm done the slideshow, I'm going to do a series of demonstrations. Okay, the select statement, which is the core piece of the language, is used to retrieve records from the database. So. What's the point of having data in a database if you can't pull it back out? And how do you pull it out? You use the select statement. In other words, please choose these rows. That's basically what the select means. Select these pieces of information. It is very, very flexible. It's made up of two, three, four, five, actually six parts. Except you can get away with just two to start with, and you add on as you need. Um, today we'll focus on the first three parts for sure, and then time permitting, we'll do some of the others. So the basic three pieces of the select statement is the field list, the list of tables, and the conditionals, also known as a phrase called predicates. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase predicate. A predicate is basically a Boolean operation. Do you know the inside of the if statement? That's also known as a predicate. So when we talk about the field list, last week you saw me demonstrate the asterisk, star. It means grab all available columns. And, or you can also do a defined field list by using comma separated field names. So you can go select star, or for example, select ID comma name. Uh, select star is great, except for the size data. Size data is gonna get moved around. If you're dealing with really big uh, data sets, it's going to eat a lot, a lot of data, um, especially considering most enterprise level architectures, the database server is not residing on the same machine as the application server or the web server. That means you're shoving huge amounts of data down not so huge pipes. And you're building it all up in memory and then it gets streamed from one machine to the other, um, which is why a lot of database developers frown upon select star. Well, when you're first learning select star is handy because it lets you see what's inside. The table list. There's three types of table lists. There's a single table, which is what we're talking about this week. There's joins, which lets you, which will be covered two lectures from now, as in this is one lecture. It'll be covered in the next lecture, like one, two. And derived tables will also be covered in two lectures from now, in other words, one, two. Um, basically, an example of syntax would be from test. So, so far, we've seen select star from test. It's exactly what I did in class last week. The conditionals, also known as the where clause. It's a series of Boolean expressions, also known as predicates. Um, I've been informed by other database profs I should use the word predicate as often as I can because apparently they feel it's an important word. Therefore, a where clause, a series of Boolean expression, a Boolean expression is also known as a predicate. What is a predicate? It's value, operator, value. And that returns a true-false statement. 
there's lots of operators. Uh, you can have multiple clauses and it, the whole bracket business, which I will demonstrate a little bit, time permitting today, otherwise it'll be next week. But brackets behave the same way as it does in math. When you work with brackets in math, how does it work? From the inside out. You resolve the small, the innermost brackets first, then work your way out from the inside. Same deal with SQL. Since technically it's algebra, it behaves the same. Now, comparison operators. The normal set, which is very similar to the C-like languages, you're used to seeing less than, less than or equal, greater than or equal, not equal, which is the exclamation mark. Uh, equality check, however, is painful for C-like developers because it's a single equal sign. You guys are used to doing equal, equal. You know, if I equal, equal five, then do this. Yeah, if you do that in SQL, it's going to ask you what's wrong with you. It uses a single equal sign. So it's going to go, if I is equal to five, because the SQL language is English-like, so they tried to keep the language fairly reasonable. Uh, the not equal can be written two different ways. It used to be the diamond operator. We called it the diamond operator, which is the less than and the greater than sign stuck together. But it's now the no, the you know, bang equal uh, is now acceptable. Uh, not all servers support it, so be comfortable with the diamond operator. Because diamond operator works because nothing can be smaller or greater than something else at the same time. That's impossible. Therefore, that's the, they came up, the, this operator they came up with to handle not equal to. However, Somewhere along the way, all the C-like developers whined and complained enough that most database developers said, yeah, we'll implement exclamation mark equals say not equal. Apparently, whining did succeed for once. It doesn't work with me. You can whine all you want. Um, there's a series of other operators that you can use. Um, and like I said, I'm going to get through the slides fairly quickly so I can actually have recorded demonstrations. There is in. In is cool. In is in a list. So you can say, give me anything where the ID is in 1, 2, 4, 5, 6. It would give me everything from 1 to 6, not including 3. In list. Some people like using in. It's a great way to handle a finite list of values. Uh, if you don't have a finite list or you're not sure what the values between point A and point B are, they got something called between, where ID between 1 and 4. It'll give you 1, 2, 3, 4. But if, say, 3 doesn't exist, it'll give you 1, 2, and 4. You don't need to know whether or not the values in between exist. It'll just grab them. Is is a true Boolean operator. It allows you to check for either th whether things are null or whether or not they're true or false. So you can say, is null? In other words, is it null? Because, and there's a reason why they picked is. Because before they came with the Booleans, because true Booleans didn't exist originally in the database servers, before they invented is true or is false, or you could say is not true or is not false, they came up with is null. Can anybody take a guess why you'd use the phrase is null as opposed to equal to null? Exactly. Well, it's not redundant, it's impossible. Nothing can be equal to null. Something can be null, but it cannot be equal to null. Computers don't like that idea. And they decide to wire it in in such a way that you cannot check for equality of null. Whereas, you know, in Java and other languages, you can check to see if I equal equal null. You can do that in Java, but what it's actually doing is actually doing, it's actually doing a bit shift and checking whether or not it actually is null. You're not actually doing an equality check. It's just letting you write it that way. Um, so you got is, which allows you to check if the value is null. So if somebody enters a row into the database and leaves a field empty, you can check to see if they left it completely, truly empty. And then you got not. Not negates the, spe the other special operators. So you can say not in 1, 2, 4, 5, 6. That means it would give you 3 and everything above 6 and everything before 1. <coughs> Anything but this list. 
you can go ID not between 1 and 4. It'll give you everything before 1 and everything after 4, not including 1 and 4. Yes? One base. Database server is only like zero base. And then you can also say is not null. So in other words, is there a value there? We don't care what the value is. So instead of saying, well, is it greater than zero? Who cares if you just want to check to see if it's null? Is there a string in there? And by the way, an empty string is not the same thing as being null. You can enter a record in the database with two quote marks side by side, and that's an empty string. That is not null. So if you want to check see if the string was empty, yet also provided an empty state, you could check with is not null. It'll at least tell you whether or not there's a value there. OK. That's actually the, the is not null is actually the hardest one to, under, to grasp from the basic operators, because the human brain doesn't like the concept of null. Because that's a concept that most people's brains don't have. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go do a quick demonstration. Then I'll come back to here because I don't want what's been shown so far to leak out of your brains too much. All right, so. The whole select star thing, we'll start with that. Now, as you can see, this returned 10,000 rows. And there's lots of columns. So if I were to say, name and email, it just returns those two columns. So that's the, if you just want to return a smaller subset. Now, how long did that take? 109, 96, 115, 154, 162. As you can see, the more you pull back, the slower the whole thing runs. Now, as humans, we look at that, we go, whatever. What's, you know, 20 milliseconds between friends? But you add up enough 20 milliseconds, eventually you're going to have a really big mess because it actually causes the other query to be delayed 20 milliseconds and the next query to be delayed 20 milliseconds. And eventually, you know, if you're operating in an environment where you're running 1,000 queries a second, those 20 milliseconds add up really fast until, you know, it's now two seconds and then four seconds and then six seconds. And after 24 hours, you're running 20 minutes behind. Seven and a half hours. And that was my fault. Because I typed something, something stupid. And I was actually stupid enough to wait for it. Actually, I forgot it was running. I went off to something else for a while. So that's the basic thing here. So I'm going to throw on a predicate, which is the where statement. And the most simplest is where id is equal to 2, for example. And a predicate contains two things. So field operator value. One of the very popular uh, exploits that people used to use in databases is where 2 is equal to 2 or 1 is equal to 1. Because it's always true. It will return everything. But I want to play with id equal to 2. As you'll see, I pull in the one person's name. Ta-da. Yes. I can put semicolon anywhere I want. It doesn't care. No, got, no, no, at the end of the command. SQL doesn't care about, I mean, realistically, I could write it like this if I wanted. Yeah, yeah, until you start writing queries that occupy an entire page, and then you'll appreciate this. But it doesn't care. I'll, I'll, later on in the term, you'll be, I'll be showing you guys some really complex queries, and you'll understand why it's necessary. Otherwise, you'll lose your mind. So there it is. So 
care, the semicolon doesn't care where it is. Carriage returns don't mean anything. Spaces and tabs don't mean anything. Spaces mean keyword delimiter. So anything that counts as white space counts as a keyword delimiter. So a tab, a space, or carriage return counts as a keyword delimiter. So here's our where clause. Punch them. Thank you. I'll use him as an example. So, so essentially, there's our basic uh, command. Now I'm going to show you guys some of the other operators. So if I go if id less than 10, it'll give me everybody before 10. Obviously, my ID start at 2, so I don't get 10 rows back. I get 8 rows back. And there it is. Um, I also showed between 1 and 4, which will return 3 rows because I don't have an ID 1. So it's doing its best to meet my, my request. It'll include, so if I go 3 and 7, just so you actually have the values, you'll see it includes 3 and everything in between 3 and 7, including 3 and 7. The between includes what I call the goalposts. So that means you're going to give it delimiters on the outside and between says everything between these two values including these two values. This is the equivalent of writing this. That's ThinkCube. The database had you guys bring in and then, you know, import and then modify. Yes, you guys wouldn't until you start playing with it in the labs, which is what's happening now. There, there are hundreds of thousands of rows of data in this database. So, as I said before, SQL is a fairly English-like language. If I go select and I say ID name and email from customers where the ID is greater than or equal to 3 and the ID is less than or equal to 7. If you can read it and it actually kind of makes sense, it's probably going to work. Is it going to do what you want it to do? Not necessarily. But it, there's 10,100 customers. And so that's basically the, the equivalent. So if I did this, it's the same thing as doing this. A lot of people prefer this because it's a lot more legible and easier to understand. Now, if I said to show you guys the negation, if I go n not knit, not between, and I run it, <coughs> you'll see number two and number eight. So it basically everything in outside of three and seven. Everything not between 3 and 7, but the between operator includes the goalposts. So it includes everything on the outside. If you wanted to include 3 and 7, you know, that's actually a question in one of the labs where you can try to figure out how to do it. Um, but I did show you guys the basic techniques already today, how to do it, just before I did this. So that's the not. I've shown you the between. I've shown you the basic operators. Um, I can also do in. And I'm actually going to include a value that does not exist. Just show you what's going to happen. What happens? Nothing. This value wasn't found on the database, so it never even, it doesn't care. It doesn't tell you it didn't work. It just says, hey, I found 4, 5, 6, 10, 300, 9,000. 1, 1, 230,000 does not exist in the database, but that's okay because, you know, it was part of a list, so any values I don't find in the list just doesn't get returned because they don't exist. It's a bit like when you go to the grocery store with a grocery list and you realize that sometimes there's a few things you need that aren't at the store. You don't get a, you don't suddenly fall on the ground and take a seizure because it, they ran out of bread. You just go, ah, oh, crap, there's no bread moving on. You know, maybe I'll go buy a French loaf instead so I, so I have some bread. You just pick something and move on. So those are the basic operators that you have at this stage. The next set that we need to address is the pattern matching. 
And Postgres has several ways of doing pattern matching. However, there is one keyword that is standard across all servers. The keyword is like. So you want to go, show me stuff that matches this pattern. In other words, show me data that is like this pattern. By the way, in Postgres, in DB2, and I think Microsoft SQL Server, definitely in Teradata, like is case sensitive. In MySQL, it's case insensitive, which means you can't do case sensitive matches. Um, in Oracle, it can be case sensitive if you tell it to be case sensitive. If you want it to be case insensitive, Postgres does provide an, an additional keyword called I like which stands for insensitive like. It does everything the like operator does, but makes it case insensitive. And you have two choices for the wildcard parameters. There's the percent sign, which means match any character any number of times, or the underscore, which means match one character once, any times. Yes? Yeah, I'm about to go do that demo. The like operator is one of the coolest ones to play with. So I'm going to work with the person's name. And the operator is called like. And you have to treat it like a string, so you have the quote marks. And let's say you want to find everybody whose name starts with A. So this says starts with A. Mind you, it's case sensitive. So if I said lowercase a, none. So if you wanted to be case insensitive, you'd either use I like, which now makes it case insensitive. Once again, we're back to where we were. Or the problem is I like is Postgres specific. So it only works in Postgres. If you want to do this on any other server, there's a function called lower. You guys, did you guys learn about string? string dot or something like that or is it just something like that anyways I'm getting my PHP and my Java confused because I don't know Java so I'm you know I'm hoping it's the same function call <laughs> sort of but not quite but you get the idea so I can do lower name and we're back to where we were or we can force it to upper if we wanted to also either way works um, this is the ANSI standard way of doing it so now I'm trying to find anybody whose name starts with a Fantastic. Let's say I want to have people who, and by the way, I got back, how many, how many rows was that? 1,243 rows came back that whose name starts with A. On the other hand, if I want to say where they have the letter A anywhere in their name, 8,500 out of the 10,000. A percent means A wildcard means anything. And percent sign A means anything before A. Percent sign means any number, any character, zero or more times. That means if A is the very first character, it's still going to find A because it says zero or more times. Uh, if I want to find anybody who's got A and ends in N, a anywhere in ends and n, I can do this, and that'll give me anybody who's got the letter A in their name and ends in n, and that even would also include anybody whose name is like right down here. See the e a n, because even though there's nothing between the a and the n, it's still a maybe something n. Um, and the other thing you can also use is, you know, a anywhere followed by n anywhere, which is kind of cool. Um, the other pattern match we can do is we could actually go one that's popular is let's say I want to find anybody whose name starts with A. And can anybody take a guess how I'd figure out somebody's last name? Let's say I want to target somebody's last name. 
based on the data that's up on the screen. Let's use this as a slight thought exercise for a second. So right now we have a combined name field, yes. Yeah, that's how you do it. You'd go. So right now I'm going to look for anybody whose name starts with A. And then whose last name starts with M. So A, anything, N, M, I mean. All right now I'm down to 168 rows. There's the A and there's the M. The A and the M. That's kind of cool. It's cheating. Um, well, it's not cheating. You're just learning what the meaning of the wildcard operators are. It is very literal. A space is a character. It will treat it as a match. So what is this is actually saying? It's saying A, anything, and then anytime you see a space M, anything. Now the, yes? I know, actually, my, uh, my language generator insisted on throwing out a lot of French names when I did this. Oh, there's some Martinez in here. And Aaron Morel. There's some English names in here, too. Now, the only other one I really want to show you guys is the underscore. See how I have an Emin Moulin? If I did A underscore I, and I'm not typing in the right place. All right, so this is going to say... Anybody whose name starts with A then has one character, and it must have at least, it must have a character. I don't care what that one character is, but there must be at least one character, and then ends with whatever. And now we've got A M I N E, A L I, A L I, A M. I guess it's Alice. I got some Alice's in here. And Alicia. So that's the set I've got in there. So that's basically how you use the, that particular piece. Um, if you wanted to find anybody's at specific email address types, you could go uh, percent sign dot com. That would give you anybody who's got a dot com address. And not in their name, in their email. There we go. There's the dot coms. Or you can turn it to edu. Yeah. I'm forcing the characters to test lowercase because if I go back to the names like this, so if I go anybody whose name starts with A, and you're just give me a second, I know your hands up. So anything that starts with A, now Postgres is case sensitive. So that means if I want to find anybody whose name starts with A, regardless of the case, I won't find any lowercase a's because everybody's name starts with an uppercase letter in this case. So what's happening is I'm forcing the check of low, the name to go lower. In actual fact, here I'll demonstrate what it's doing by putting it up here. Now you can see here how the name was up mixed case. Now it's lowercase. So I'm, I'm forcing the check to be lowercase. Uh, instead of relying on the Postgres I like, which essentially that's all I like is doing, is it's taking the thing to the left and forcing it probably lowercase. And it's taking what's to the right and making it lowercase. That's what it's doing. I don't care which one, but lower name will get you the right mess muscle memory to work with Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server. Just the last letter being what? A, anything N. And I'll grab everybody whose name starts with A, ends in N. Or do you mean their first name or the whole name? A? That works? Okay. All right, so that's pattern matching version one. Now, I don't spend any time on similar to because not all database servers offer it. Uh, MySQL does not have similar to. Microsoft SQL Server does not offer similar to. It offers something similar to similar to, but it's not similar to. Uh, it allows you to do significantly more robust pattern matching. Uh, for example, you can tell it, give me anything that contains 
B or D, which is this example right there. Anything that contains B or D. Whereas this one is saying, you know, anything that starts with B or C. And that's not going to work. So those are examples of similar to, if you actually want to see how it works, I provided a link in the slide to go dig into it. Um, how many times have I used similar to in my career? Anybody want to take a guess? None. Zero. I've never needed to use it once in my career. 99% of the pattern matching I've done has worked with like. And there used to be another slide right after this, pattern matching number three. Why did I, what's that last one percent? I use regular expressions. Uh, if you guys don't know what regular expressions are, or some of you may not know, uh, may know, um, you can use regular expressions inside of Postgres. Feel free to look it up. Um, it is quite uh, interesting and amazing what you can do with it, but it also is definitely outside the scope of this course. <sighs> All right. The next one is multiple and grouped conditionals. As I said before, we can include brackets to change the rules of how things operate. And I'll demonstrate in a second, but essentially multiple conditions, you use either and, and, or, or. And it has an order of operation and it always resolves the ands before it does the ors. Just so you know. So if you've got multiple ands and ors, it'll resolve all the ands and then the ors. I'll demonstrate in a second what I mean by that. But if you really want to force the rules, you can use brackets to force the resolution first. And it always resolves the brackets first and then expands out to the, the rest of the, uh, the predicates. Now, it's just like an algebra or standard math. You, use bra you do the small brackets on the inside first, work your way out, and it's the same way with this. Okay, so if I go back, so I'm going to keep this, and if I were to say, actually, is there a ninth on this list before I start trying to get fancy? All right, so I don't have a 9,000. So what this is going to say is going to say, give me anybody whose name starts with this or the ID is 9,000. Actually, let me go see what the first value is in the list. Two. Okay, we'll go with ID three. So what this is going to say is it's going to give me anybody whose name is like that pattern, which we finished demonstrating, or the ID is equal to three. So if I run that, now we got three. Three doesn't match the pattern, but it's saying one or the other. I could also say something I'm causing him to lose my train of thought. Um, I could also say where the ID of the ID is between two and one hundred, which now returns exactly six rows. So that's the A ends between 1 and 100, or 2 and 100, which is great. It does the trick. Now, each of these operate on a single, as a single predicate. So now, as I said earlier, if I want to do all of this, it'll give me all of these plus the 125, but what happens if I want this operation to happen. So where ID is between 2 and 100 or the ID is equal to 125 and then it gives me the A to N. If I run that, 125 is gone. Because what it's doing is it's giving me first the list of between 2 and 100 and then it's including 125. So that gives me one subset of records and then it does the, the pattern match on it. That it takes that then it filters it one more time. So every time you add brackets, you can make it more and more precise in how you do your searches. It's cute. It's a bit of a trick. Um, 
And it's really easy to mess up. Just like when you're learning how to do multiple conditionals in Java, where you know you got if this or this and that. So the order of operations is always resolves the ands before it does the ors. It's easy to remember. Um, and then it's brackets first. So brackets, ands, or. Um, so that's that one. And I actually showed all that already. All right. I'm going to go back to this query. And I'm just. So let's just say I just want to pull back the person's name to start with. So I'm still pulling back 120, 184 rows. The next item I want to talk about is called distinct. Distinct is a keyword that tells you to return just the unique values out of what's being pulled back. Um, in actual fact, I'm actually going to take off my where clause completely. So you can see there's still 10,100 rows being returned. If I were to tell it to return the distinct names, I get 8,795. Now, why would that be? That's because, and I forgot the number off the top of my head, there's um, about 2,000 names that are repeated in the database. So this, what it does, it retrieves all the names from the database. And as it's retrieving each one, it's putting them in a list. OK, so it takes that, it'll go name number one, put it in the array. You guys haven't learned about arrays. OK, take num name number one, put it in the basket. Ta name number two, is it in the basket yet? No, put it in the basket. Name number three, is it in the basket? Yes, OK, let's skip it. Name number four, is it in the basket? No, puts it in the basket. So it only keeps the unique versions of every name. Now, this is handy, except when people get caught up and they include something like the primary key. What's special about the primary key? It's always unique, so it doesn't repeat. Therefore, distinct works against the entire row being returned. That means if I include the primary key for the ride, I'm going to get 10,000 rows back because the primary key changes with every row. Yes. Uh, no, at this point in time, you're getting the raw order that's inside the database instead of a sort order. Um, just because it normally looks like two to 10,000 doesn't mean it's always that order. It's stored in the disk. When you start messing with the distinct, it starts being a little more true to the spirit of what's inside the server. Okay. My car's been returned. And so that gives you the basic set of what comes out. It sorts based on what's found in the database. Um, so that's distinct. There's not much to know about it other than it operates on the entire rule what you've pulled back. So the more columns you include, the more uniqueness you're going to have, less likely distinct is going to be useful for you. So normally you don't include the primary key. You might not include phone numbers. But maybe you want to find all the unique phone numbers. Or maybe you want to find all the unique email addresses in the database where you have a big pile of, uh, you get a dump from a contact form. Uh, anybody here run their own website? OK, just one. OK. Do you have a contact form on your website? OK, well, you could actually have a contact form on there, right? And the person fills it out, they hit Submit. And depending on what kind of system you're using, it takes the results that shoves it in a database. And you could have the same person fill out that contact form three or four times. That means you'll have their email address three or four times. Now, at the end of the month, you want to send out a mailer. You don't want to send the same email to the same person three or four times. You want to grab the distinct email addresses. Except against the law. No. Don't, yeah, the spam laws, don't even touch those. So that's distinct. Distinct is good because sometimes you need to know the distinct 
values. When we start working with set operators later in the term, this is when the distinct business really comes to shine. You'll really see what it can do. Um, the other one, since Phoenix kindly asked me why is things coming out in a weird order, the next one we're going to talk about is the order by clause, which comes right at the end. And you can go order by field. You can force it to be ascending or descending order. And ascending means alphabetically 0 to 9, A to Z, lowercase, uppercase A to Z, because that's how it's in the ASCII table and that's how it's going to sort. And you can sort by multiple fields by comma delimiting them. Allow me to demonstrate. So, as you mentioned, why is it coming out in a funny order? Well, I could say order by ID. So this is going to say, give me the distinct, and this makes absolutely no difference, but give me the distinct ID name from customers and order it by the ID. So we do this, and now we're back to sort it the way we were seeing it earlier. If we wanted to, we could sort by name, ascending. And now we got all the errands come up first because, you know, errands are special. Their name was designed to come up first alphabetically no matter what the heck. And as you'll see, it sorts by the first letter, then the second letter, the third letter, and it, on and on until it hits the outside edge. And eventually in here, we probably can hit some duplicates if we look long enough. Yeah, there's a couple of Aaron Martins in here and a couple of Aaron Martinez and two Aaron Meniers. You know, various sundry names all sort alphabetically. Um, however, let's say I want to get rid of the distinct and include the person's city. And now here's our city. And it's still sorted first by name and then by city. However, let's where are we where are our duplicates? There we go. See, Aaron Martin, Sandy, Aaron Martin, Genval, Aaron Martinez, and can't pronounce that. The other Aaron Martinez is in Dublin. So yeah. No, that you can't put the ascending, descending rules up here. You've got to put it down here as part of the order by clause. So right now I'm sorting by name. I could theoretically go sort by city, descending, and then by name, ascending. So that will give me Z cities first, and then sorted by their name. So if you look in whatever the heck this is, F comes before Q. Or if I look inside of Yorkton, you'll see A, C, K, L, M, T. So it's sorted by the city in reverse order and then by name in, in alphabetical order. This is great. It works for all kinds of things. Yes. No, it's got its own ASCII character. And if I remember, that's called a numlout. I had, I was, had to go pull that out of back in the back of my brain. So yeah, the, the those are not. That's just that part of the ASCII's character set. All right. So that's the ordering. So so far, you've seen me pull one, two, multiple columns, all the columns. You've seen me do various where clauses. I've played with the ordering. I've shown you distinct. That is enough for a significant chunk of the basic querying you'll experience. Um, the, yeah, that's basically all the bits and pieces for this. Really quickly, uh, I need to discuss one other little bit, of, little bit has to do with the where, which some terms I forget to do and I remembered while I was taking my little break. Dates. Dates suck. I've showed you guys how to work with strings. I've showed you how to work with numbers. Dates are terrible in their own way. And let me demonstrate. So in ThinkCube, there's also an orders table. 
And I'm going to select everything from orders. So I'm going to do the, bid, the big bad where I tell it give me everything. Now, there's 47,000 rows in orders, <coughs> just so you have an idea of the size of the data set. And orders has a bunch of order dates. So so I'm just going to pull back two pieces here, just the ID and the order date. Still pulling back 47,000 rows. And what's tricky about dates is a lot of people, if you're just working with pure dates, that's easy. If you're working with pure time, that's easy. So when you start working with date times, where things get a little weird. So let's say I want everything on October 26, 2015. For starters, <coughs> dates look like strings. So, I want everything on this date. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to go run. Now, right here, we can see right here, row number one, right? There's a reason why I picked that exact value. Hey, look at this. I got nothing. No, you can't use wildcards because it's a date. Let's bring this back the way it was for a second. And now I wrote in my date again. Let's look at this date. 4.47 a.m. When you do a date like this, you don't provide the time, it assumes this. Which is why dates suck. <coughs> if you just apply the date, it assumes midnight, dead midnight. Strike of midnight. Which means, is 4.47 a.m. on the 26th Midnight? No. So how do you find everything on that date? Well, there's a few different ways. Yeah. You can go between. And you could either, like you said, you could put in the time. And in theory, you could put in And that will give me everything on the 26th. That's kind of gross. Because it, there really are gross queries to write. The other choice you could use is you could cheat a little bit and use the next day. Because this always assumes. And what are the odds that something's going to go in at the very moment? nanosecond of midnight. The odds of that actually happening are, you know, you got a better chance of winning the mega millions in the U.S. right now than that happening in real life. So if I do this, this will return the same 77 rows. So the rule with dates is it's anal retentive. It always includes the time if you're working with a date time field or a timestamp field, depending on the database server. Postgres calls it timestamp. Other servers call it date time. If you're working with just pure dates, then you could literally just say, you know, if the order date was literally just a date, then you could just put in the date and that would work. But if you're working with timestamps, you got to take into account the time portion also. And that if you don't include it, it always assumes dead midnight. It's just something to remember. Um, there are a few useful functions for working with dates. Um, oh, I hope I remember the syntax off the top of my head. <laughs> no, I remembered it wrong because it's the other way around. Nope, still got it wrong. 
that shows you how often I use this function. Um, let me Google that for you. Oh, you know what I was doing wrong? This is my SQL syntax. There we go. Extract year from this. That means it'll give me anything that's 2015. Now you can get really fancy. You could go extract month. So let's say you want to go, you want to know year over year everything that happened in October. And now you'll have everything happen in October regardless of the year. There's cute tricks you can do with dates. There's tons of tricks actually you can do with dates. And if you use the combination of extract, between, or even in, let's say I want September, October. There's September, October. Nah, nah, there's 47,000 rows in order. Yeah, there's lots more in that one. The further down you go, the more records there are. Yeah. Well, the order lines has over 100,000 rows in it, so yeah, it would suck. All right, 100,000. I once had a student complain to me that the data sets didn't feel real. I said, fine. Next term, they're going to have a data set that looks real. Feels real. And now I have students complaining that their laptops are too slow. Not my problem. So the next topic is aggregates and grouping. Aggregate functions are a challenging topic. How many of you know how to use Excel? How many of you know how to actually use the, fu the uh, summarization functions in Excel? Sum, average, min, max. Yeah, okay, fewer hands went up on that one. People that have taken business know all about those functions, right? The Excel wizards. Now, those are known also as aggregate functions. They allow you to aggregate data. It's like magic. And Essentially, it's used to summarize data, and you can use them in the field selection area. And it's usually paired with one or two display fields because other than a very specific use case, there is no reason to ever use an aggregate on the whole database without actually giving it values. And if you, are have, if you do have display fields, you must include a clause called group by, which I'll be demonstrating momentarily. Um, one of this is actually this the, the last item in this slide is the reason why years ago I switched away from MySQL and went to Postgres uh, for demonstrating this. Because MySQL is dumb. It allows you to run an aggregate without a group by clause. And then it starts to lie. Uh, because if you have a display field, it grabs the very first value and then it gives you saying, this field is equal to this value, which is not the truth. It's lying. It just tries to get smart for you, which by being smart is being dumb. Now, here are the most common aggregate functions that most people will use. Count. It counts the number of rows in your result set. The result set, you know, you type in your query, you hit run. And so far, you know, post my PG admin has been popping up that little number in the corner for you guys. So you can see, you know, I've returned 8,000 rows, 10 rows, whatever. That's a result set. Count actually counts the values. Min max. Finds the lowest value, finds the biggest value. Sometimes it's handy to know what the maximum value is. Average. You want to find the average value in a field. In other words, what is the average price something sold for? Sum. It adds up all the values in a given column for that result set. 
Postgres has 14 additional aggregate functions that are used for stats analysis. So Postgres has a, you know, 18, 19 aggregate functions. It's actually got more than that now. Uh, at the time that these slides were created years ago, it had that many. They've added a whole big pile now of all these weird edge case uh, aggregate functions, but they're there. Um, so now to show some aggregates. And I'm actually going to go I'm going to grab everything from order lines. Now, 114,705 rows. Right? It's a slightly larger subset. And let's just say actually I want to grab the price and the order ID. Once again, that just gives me these two rows. And let's just say, oh, we want one more thing in here, actually. We're going to grab the product ID. I think I called it that. Product version. OK. Thank you. Yeah, just like that. Now, here's my product version ID, price. So these numbers will mean more to you guys next week. But this is, I just needed a subset to work with. So let's say I want to order by order ID. All right, so in order ID 25,330, I've got three different products in it. One, two, three. All right? This one only has one product. Uh, 32 has four or five products. Kind of handy, kind of cute. It does what it needs to do. Now let's just say I want to get this to be a little more useful. And I want to know, and I'm going to take off the product version I just for a second. I want to know the say the average price of each item per order. And the heck? There's absolutely nothing wrong with my query. This is new. Oh, yeah. Oh, shoot. You know, I've gone SQL blind. I was ordering, not grouping. All right. So for product 116, the average is $62. And yes, it is. So for each of the products in here, in actual fact, I can actually now Let's sort this from the smallest to biggest. So we got the average price for a product version and from the order line. It's a useful number. At least you know what the average selling price was for each of those. Um, or I could also go give me the average quantity. Also. And it's not that, it's probably this. There's the average quantity. So on average product 102, sold for 29.34 and there was contained about three per, every time it was ordered, that was the average number it got. Now these numbers would make a manager complain, yeah. It's calculated on the fly, not being stored at all, not being stored. It's being calculated on the fly. Now, I'll show you guys one handy function called round.
Now, round is probably the most important function I'm going to show you guys today. Why? Because I often I'll have people lose one or two points on their practical exam because they don't know how to round. Well, they get a number that looks like this, and they go, ah, it's, I'm four digits in, that must be that. And then they round up to two decimal places, a little, little they know a little further down, it would cause the whole thing to cascade up. So round, rounds for you. Learn how to use it. Because apparently humans don't know how to round. Rounding up, rounding down, what do you round at? Where do you round up? Five rounds up. How many people were thinking, ah, six goes up? No, it starts rounding at five. Zero to four goes down. Five to nine goes up. Ah, exactly. So that's the average. I could also ask for um, the, the lowest price it's sold for and the maximum price it's sold for. And then the average price it's sold for, which these are all stats that managers like to see. So sold at a minimum for 10 bucks, maximum 135. Man, that was a good sales rep. And then the average was 129. That means it sold much more often closer to 135 than it did to 10. So these this is just stats, but you know, this is how you can get the database server to do the math for you. Um, some people try to get clever, and they will go some price divided by the sum of the quantity to calculate the average. And again, that is not how the math actually works. Because it's, when you do the average price, it literally looks at all the prices and just averages them. If you do the uh, sum of the price of a quantity, it's not going to be the right number because it's not even in the same ballpark. It's not even the right calculation. But I just demonstrated something else. You can do math right in your select statement. Right? I take this value divided by that value. I can go sometimes, and that'll give me a, a really big number. Other stuff you can do with here. But that's the aggregate functions. I'm going to switch back to my customers table for a second. Now I'm going to just do a count without any rules. Okay, so we know where there's 10,000 customer, 10,000 and change customers in the database. Now let's just say I want to know how many customers there are per city. Now I'm going to show you guys an error message. That was on purpose. If you ever see something that looks like this, column must appear in the group by clause or use an aggregate function. That means you were being as stupid as I was earlier. And you forgot to include your group by. And now we've got the name of the city and how many customers lives in each city. Apparently. And I can order by the city. And there we go with alphabetically sorted. You can. You literally go order by the count. And sort of descending, so biggest to smallest. So apparently it's 535 customers in Berlin, followed by 447 in Dublin, Ireland, and 442 in Galway, wherever the heck that is. Oh, look at this. And 365 in Belfast. Apparently there's a lot of Irish people in this. So, and apparently 336 in Hamburg, so you know, I don't know, but man, the, the Germans and the Irish really love it. Potatoes and sausages. That we're, not, we're not being racially profiling there at all. Um, but that's one of the ways that also use an aggregate is to find the totals in set locations. Um, 
There's a whole bunch. You can use them at the same time. There's one thing you cannot do. Let's just say you want to know what the average number of customers there is per city. The human brain says, I can do this. I'm going to get rid of the order. And it's going to say, aggregate functions cannot be nested. Because it's the how the database interprets the data. It retrieves everything from customers. Once it's done pulling everything back, it starts going through the list. And it says, city A, one. City A, oh, add one more. City, you know. And it does all the math, gets to the end, and then it's summarized already. What you're asking it to do is to go read the list, summarize it, now run a second summary. But you can't do a summary of a summary because it doesn't let you. Logically, you can't do that. So next week, I'll show you guys how to do this. There is a way to do this. It's just you can't do it like that. So if you ever try to nest aggregate functions, this is the result you're going to get. You're going to get something that doesn't work quite right. So I'm going to switch this back to the way it was, like such. And do I have this in here? Oh. That slide's missing something really important. The booklet, the PDF booklet, has one more clause that's really, really handy to have. So you guys have seen the where clause, right? Where, you know, filter on the raw data. There's one more kind of filtering you can do. It's called having. And having only works with group by. So All right, so this one's going to count by city anybody whose name starts with A. It's a pretty, this is a bit of everything I've shown you guys together in one place. However, let's say I just want to know any city that has somebody whose name starts with A that has more than one customer in it. I don't want onesies. Onesies are useless to me. I want those that have more than one. The last clause goes down here. It's called having. And then you go count of star greater than one. Having can only work once you've summarized the data. So this allows you to filter out after the math has been done. So back to those that know how to use Excel. Have you ever used conditional formatting on your Excel spreadsheets? Yeah, there we go. We just blew right past the skill level. In Excel, you can set up rules saying if the values in these cell are past a certain thing, change the color. So if, you know, the average salesman, his numbers are dropping every month, you can say, well, they must sell at least $10,000 worth of stuff every month. And suddenly, you know, you can set a rule that says it goes red for those guys that are below. So you can go and start whipping them. So if I run it like this, now it gets rid of all the singles. It's a great tool to start summarizing. On the other hand, I could turn around, and next week when I start showing you guys how to connect more than one table, I could say, give me all the customers that have more than three orders. Those are maybe customers we want to pursue more often. Or maybe we want to go after the customers that only ever placed one order so we can find out why they never bought a second thing from us. Right? There's all kinds of things you can do with this. It's just a case of learning how to interpret it. And now I've got a sorting by city. Now, if I look at this example, remember earlier I talked about how it's made up of five or six pieces? Select, from, where, group, having, order. There's the six pieces. Everything else is contained within that subset of pieces. Mind you, those pieces can get very big and complex. However, everything can be contained inside that subset. Now, the next slide is aliases. And I used to always make a reference to a really terrible show that used to run on TV years ago with Jennifer Garner. But it's gotten to the point where all of you are so young now you have no idea what I'm talking about. So I'm done talking about Alias, the TV show. 
Um, but an alias in the real world, not talking about the database, is when something goes by another name, right? I mean, most people have a nickname of some sort. Whatever it happens to be your nickname. You know, I had a friend whose nickname was Bonehead. Why was he Bonehead? Because he was a Bonehead. But nobody called him Bonehead. Actually, by the time he finished high school, almost nobody remembered his real name. Well, it's okay. He actually answered to Bonehead. Even his actually, at one point, one of the teachers forgot themselves and called him Bonehead in class, which was hilarious and demoralizing all at the same time. But he was a really nice guy. He just wasn't very sharp. Um, but basically, put an alias as a way of renaming something. And inside the database server, it allows you to rename any given piece of the server. And field renaming is really good to make sure you have valid field names. Sometimes you get, it gets a little weird when you pull back the same column from more than one table, which I'm not demonstrating this week, but I'll show you guys next week. So let's say you're pulling the column called ID twice. Now, depending on your programming language, for example, PHP, you can't have two array elements with the same name. So what happens is ID, it gets, ID gets set once, and then it gets set to the second time it sees the same thing. So you, you can only ever retrieve one ID column out of the database. It's kind of gross. Um, but it's actually really handy to rename things. For example, this count, as you can see right here, it's coming out as count as the column name. That's because that's the name of the function. Now, if you remember earlier when I had the three averages, you literally had product ID, average, average, average. And it meant nothing. Because at that point, which column actually means anything? It's all called average. So you can do aliases, which allows you to rename. And I make this mistake every single term. Do you notice I'm not using single quotes, I'm using double quotes in this case. That's because aliases are objects. And an object identifier in Postgres is double quotes. Now, if I don't have a space, I don't need the quote marks. Just putting it out there. In MySQL, you'd be using a backtick. In Microsoft SQL Server, you'd be using square brackets. I don't remember what the heck it is in Oracle. So now instead of saying count, now it says customer count. As you can see right here. And, you know, this is pretty good the way it is. There once was a time, and then we're going back to when I was in school here, where when we handed in our SQL homework, we actually sent the report to the line printer. So we type in our commands, and then we type in another command, and then we'd rerun the previous command. And suddenly you'd hear this machine take off and sound like a Gatling gun in the corner. And then you'd run to see if that's your print job that came out. <coughs> and it looked like everybody else's. So it was really challenging to make sure it was your own work. The slackers were really clever. They'd just stand next to the line printer and rip off the next page and hope it was the right. You know, that's called plagiarism back in sneaker net days. Um, but... We actually had to write reports, and we'd actually run SQL statements and output them as proper reports. So we could actually do things that looked like this. And now I have pretty headers. So if I were to send that straight to a printer, it would come out looking like a real report. That's an alias. You can rename tables. You can rename columns. You can rename tables. I'll show you guys tables next week when we start doing joins. Yes? Yeah, you'd, you'd take this and now put that to an Excel spreadsheet or to a CSV file. And you, you put in nice headers for them to understand what it is they're looking at. Now, string functions are used to manipulate strings. I've actually shown you guys a few already. They're similar to what you find in most program languages. But here are some that you've seen. You've seen lower, 
which is, I've shown you guys the way when I was using the where clause in the like command, right? Lower the string. We have the opposite called upper. Send it the other way. Uh, trim. Trim is something you've probably seen in Java. Get rid of white space. And you can tell it to trim the leading characters, the trailing characters, trim from both. And you can tell it to actually trim what characters. Instead of just trimming spaces, you can tell it trim tabs. Trim the letter A. So nobody's name is allowed to start with A. Well, it only it don't only take care of either end, right? Not anywhere inside. You got substring, which allows you to split a string. So you say I want everything from the name field from position one to five. So it'll give you the first five letters of everybody's name. So if you're curious on how they calculate your username here, believe it or not, it's actually automated. There's a little more brains to it than this, but they'll actually go and go um, grab the first four letters of your last name. And if you don't have enough for the four letters, they start padding it with zeros. And then they retrieve to say, what's the next possible value for the, num for the number? So if you've got a really low digit after your, in your, your email address, you know, 0004 or 00003, that means you're probably the third or fourth person with your last name that attended this school. Just saying, if ever you're curious. Position allows you to find whether or not a string exists inside another string. So you want to know where the letter A is in a string. It'll give you back a number that says the A is in position 2. A is in position 1. And length is actually probably the one the handiest. How long is this string? These are all things you've probably seen in Java. If not, you will see them sooner or later. Most database servers offer the same. These are what's considered the universal functions. These exist in pretty much every server. Uh, Postgres has another 15 or 20 string functions, uh, including converting from binary to hex, hex to binary. Um, mixed case, uppercasing just the first letter of every word, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, date functions, because date math sucks. Some useful date function. And actual fact, it just goes to show that my extract that I wrote these slides when I was using MySQL because I typed in the MySQL syntax for the extract. Uh, but now is one of the most useful functions for date. Now gives you now. Every server supports the function called now. Whereas not all servers use the magic keywords. Like in Postgres, you could use a keyword called current underscore timestamp. It gives you the exact same thing as now. But it won't work on MySQL or may not work in Oracle, whereas now will work everywhere. All right, a few numeric functions. Uh, ABS, absolute value. Modulus. You guys should remember modulus from high school. Now you probably have to do modulus now, right? Take one number, divide it by another number, and give you the remainder. Postgres will do it for you. Actually, technically, you could do most of your algebra homework through Postgres. Theoretically, possible if you can figure out how to type it in. Round. I showed you guys round already. What's round good for? It lets you not screw up your rounding. Floor. Also a very useful function. It drops, you'd give it a number. That has decimal places, it strips off the decimal places. So if you give 3.4, it'll give you 3. If you give it 3.9, it'll still give you 3. It basically gives you the integer without the decimal places. If it's a 0 point something, it'll return 0. By the same token, you can also ask for ceiling, which I don't have included in here, which means always round up to the next possible value. So if it's 3.1, it'll give you 4. If it's 3.9, it'll give you 4. Random. Gives you a random number between 0 and 1. Doesn't mean it'll give you either 0 or 1. It'll give you a float between 0 and 1. So 0.325, blah, 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 blah. Actually, that one, that, that one does doesn't do it justice if I don't actually type it in. I just don't want to lose this command because it's actually got one of everything in it.
There's my random number. I want a two-digit number. And I want to round it. Actually, I don't want to do that. I want to floor it. And then add one. And I've got a type. No, I just highlighted. Random number between 0 and 100. Between 1 and 100. You have to do math. I want a six-sided dice. Or even better, I want to roll a 20-sided dice. And it's a plus three sword. Two had a great sword. Two D twenty damage plus three. Just saying. But that's, you know, random. And math. That's actually a perfect example of how to do a dice roll. And that was the last slide. So today was an info dump. I will provide those two last examples. I'll post them on Blackboard tomorrow so I copy pasted it out of there so I don't lose them. And um, lab six and seven is what you should be working on. You have everything you need to do lab six and seven. Knock yourselves out.